Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire.in. My guest today is Rajya Sabha MP for the Akali Dal, Naresh Gujral. And over the next 45 minutes, I shall talk to Mr. Gujral about the budget, about the NDA and its future, about the judicial crisis facing the country, the Padmavati controversy, and of course also about the recent Raj Rajasthan by-election results. Mr. Gujral, let's begin with the budget. And let's start with that most spectacular announcement, which is the health insurance scheme for some 10 crore families or 500 million people at roughly 5 lakhs per family per year. Now, this is a wonderful scheme, but it's also a very expensive one. And yet the budget has only allocated 2,000 crore for the scheme. And many people are now today saying that this sounds like a big promise, undermined by poor allocation, leading to questions about whether delivery will ever happen. How do you respond to that concern? Well, first of all, I welcome this because the poor in this country were absolutely getting destroyed by lack of health care. And today you know how expensive health care is. So even 5 lakhs, I think, is barely enough for something like cancer. So I welcome it. But coming to your point of how would they fund it, what has come in the public domain so far from the Niti has been that they calculate that the total expense would be somewhere in the vicinity of 10 to 12,000 crores, of which the center would foot 60 percent and 40 percent would be the share of the states. I personally think 10 to 12,000 is an understatement. This could be perhaps double of that, maybe 25,000. But both the finance minister and the finance and the prime minister have repeatedly asserted that irrespective of the figure, they will fund it. The question is, how much of an under-assessment is the Niti figure of 10 to 11,000? NDTV on Thursday night, just hours before Niti came out with their assessment, spoke to five different insurance companies who gave a range between 20,000 crore per year at the low end up to 100,000 crore at the upper end. And Mr. Chidambaram's assessment goes all the way up to 150,000 lakh crore. Now, the question is, the government's allocation of just 2,000 is just 10% of the lowest of those estimates. And people wonder, is this a jumla? I don't think it's a jumla for the simple reason that the 1% extra cess that they're imposing would fetch them 10 to 12,000 crores. So the money is there. And as I said, Prime Minister and Finance Minister have repeatedly asserted that irrespective of what it costs, they will fund it. Don't forget, by the time the scheme rolls out, six months of the year would be gone. So the figure of say 10 to 12,000 th that they would collect would be enough for the first year because my assessment is the figure would be closer to 20 to 25,000. Mr. Chidambaram has often been wrong with his figures. All right. You're saying basically that the commitment to fund it adequately is there, although we don't know how much that funding will actually require. The question is, if it goes beyond the 20,000 you're estimating, closer towards 30, 40 or 50,000 and leave Mr. Chidambaram's figure out of it. The insurance company speaking to NDTV said that it could at the upper end go up to 1,000 lakh crore. At that level, at that level, the government may be committed, but it would be financially deeply constrained. Well, these are early days. Let's see when it gets rolled out. Let's see what the quotations are. But as I said, I think the government is prepared for up to 25,000 crores. Half of that they would be raising through the CES and to fund another 10 to 12,000 crores is not a big deal for a budget this size. Let's then come to another election announcement, a budget announcement, forgive me, that has created great cheer. This time for farmers, this is the announcement that the minimum support price will now be calculated at one and a half times the production cost. The problem is that if you look at the precise words the finance minister used in his budget speech, He's clearly indicating that important crops could be left out. I'm going to quote him for you. He says, the government has decided to keep MSP for all unannounced crops of Kharif. Mark those words, all unannounced crops of Kharif at 1.5 times their production cost. And MS Swaminathan, who is perhaps this country's leading expert on agriculture, has told the Hindu that that clearly excludes paddy and millets. Now, you come from a state where paddy is a very important crop. Are you concerned that paddy could be excluded from this MSP? Again, it depends on the formula. What is the formula for this? Is it A2 or is it C2? Or is it A2 
plus family labor. Can I can I interrupt? Regardless of what the fam formula is, and that's a different concern. That is simply whether the 1.5 is generally 1.5 or not. The fact that you're talking about unannounced crops, Mr. Swaminathan says that clearly leaves out paddy. Paddy is an important crop in your state, Punjab. Your most important crop could be left out. I will be very frank. C2 for paddy, government cannot afford because that means taking up the MSP by 50%. That would play havoc with the economy. You mean taking up the existing MSP? Exactly. What the MSP today is, if you follow C2, then the prices have to go up by 50% overnight. But if they were to follow A2 plus family labor, then it is doable. Yes, prices would go but up. Hired labor is left out. Sorry, but hired labor. No, 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 no. Hired out. labor is part of A two. Hired labor is part of A two plus family labor. So that is. So that would be acceptable. That would be acceptable to start with because that would give. I would. I would guess they would have to raise the prices by about fifteen percent. Uh, this year, you're being very kind and generous. You're saying that if the formula used is not C two which is what most agricultural trade unionists are insisting on, but is A2 plus FL, family labor, that would be acceptable to you, Naresh Gujral, to start, and I presume, with, to start with. And I presume it would be acceptable to the Akali Dal as well. To only to start with. But we would want the government to go to the exact Swaminathan formula, which is C2. How quickly? Even if they do it over two years, I'm okay with it. In other but words, you're giving them two years to do it. Look, this is, we, we live uh, responsibly. Overnight, if they were to raise it 50%, can you imagine the kind of inflation that would create? You've answered one of my questions, which is, are you happy with the formula that is in mind? And you're saying you're happy with A2 plus FL, provided it moves to C2 within two years. But what about Mr. Swaminathan's earlier concern? that when you talk about unannounced crops, you're excluding paddy. And paddy is a critical crop for the Punjab. Look, I have spoken to the finance minister. One thing is very clear. Wheat and paddy are definitely going to be part but of it. But then doesn't he need so to make one it clear to people like Mr. Swami when, when it comes to wheat, even if they were to follow C2, the prices would go up by only 7 to 8% which I think the finance minister is prepared for. It's and the paddy proof, that's the problem. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. The wheat crop is coming in May. But you know, you said something interesting. You've personally spoken to the finance minister yes. and you've got a personal assurance that paddy is covered. But however, Dr. Swami Nathan in the Hindu has publicly raised the concern that that expression unannounced crops excludes paddy. Now, doesn't the finance minister need to make this crystal clear for everyone? He's given you a personal assurance. Shouldn't he give a public assurance I that think, all crops are covered? I think, A, he will do that soon. When? And second, the farmers are very lucky that this is the election year. So, in an election year, there cannot be a jumla. In an election year, they cannot, they, there is no scope for bluff and bluster. They will have to do something. The safety net for farmers lies in the fact this is election year and exactly. the BJP will skewer itself if they actually end up giving a jumla. Exactly. Let me raise another concern. If this does genuinely cover all crops, including paddy, as you said, then the Hindu says that it's quite possible that the actual food subsidy allocation in the budget for the next year is far too little to cover all crops. Because if it's going to be 1.5 times production, the food subsidy allocation increase of a modest 29,000 is simply inadequate for all crops. Well, I have not gone into the numbers that they have provided for, but as I said earlier, once this kind of a commitment is made in an election year, and more so after the debacle that they just faced in uh, Rajasthan, I doubt very much that any prime minister or finance minister would try to go back on their word. The whole thing hinges on the fact that this is an election year, and in an election year to let people down with false promises would be electorally fatal. Disastrous. Let me give you a second example of what I'm beginning to call big promises made in the budget, but inadequate funding to back them up. And this time the example comes from the very ambitious rural package in the budget. Now, as you know, the government plans to spend 14.3 lakh crore on a variety of different rural schemes. Of that 14.3 lakh crore, 11.98 lakh crore is going to be raised from extra budgetary sources. Now, if that money is not forthcoming, the free electricity, the free gas, the toilets the government wants to build simply won't happen. But if that extra budgetary resource is forthcoming, 
then you've effectively squeezed out the private sector just when you want private sector investment to grow. It seems either way, the government's got a problem on its hands. Look, you're right about one thing, that the money has to be there. But what the finance minister said was not free electricity. He said free electricity connections. Similarly, it's free gas connections, not free gas or free electricity. So th th let's be very clear on that. Second is, where would the funds come from? Today, there is enough money going around, which is willing to come because after all, there is the, 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 the guarantee of the state. But you are right, that would squeeze the private sector. But Karan, the fact of the matter is that both in the manufacturing sector and in the power sector, there is underutilization of capacity today. So I don't think, in fact, the government is very keen that private sector investment should take place. But as long as their capacity is not utilized, they, I don't think they're going to invest there. I, I accept willingly the point you're making that the finance minister spoke about not free electricity, but free electricity connections and similarly with gas. But what about the bigger point I'm making that if out of 14.3 lakh crore, 11.98 lakh crore is to be raised from extra budgetary sources, and if you succeed, you're squeezing out the private sector just when the critical need for the economy is to get private sector investment going. That could be counterproductive. As I said earlier, private sector invests only when there is demand. All this will create a demand. And when the demand is created, government starts to collect more taxes, the, the revenues go up, and then the private sector... So you're banking on a virtuous cycle, getting absolutely. the government out of a difficult position. Well, actually, I think the finance minister has thought it through and very cleverly because now look at his challenges. Where was the country? You have a huge agrarian crisis on the one hand. You also had to be fiscally responsible because if you were not, then you will not get FDI and also your, your inflation rate would go up. Keeping all these things in view. He's walked a tightrope very carefully. He said... He is f doing what I call the Reagan economics, which is you create the demand and then... Well, this is very interesting. On the one hand, you say he's doing very good economics and you've also at the same time said that the finance minister, I think these are the exact words, has thought this through very cleverly. Yes. Let me give you two examples where this finance minister has made promises, not just in this budget, but in earlier budgets as well. So it's a repeated promise which simply cannot be fulfilled. The first example is the promise made in 2015 to reduce corporate tax from 30% to 25%. I accept that in this budget, when he's extended it to companies with a turnover of up to 250 crore per year, he's covered in numbers terms, something like 95, 96%, 99% of all companies. But the truth is that in value terms, which is much the more important criteria, He's actually excluded pretty close to 99% of all companies. And since this is the last budget before elections, I put it to you, this is one promise made five years ago that he's failed to fulfill. In fact, I'll go stronger. He's reneged upon it because he's done it knowingly. Look, Karan, in an election year, you have to balance very carefully between economic considerations and political necessity. But he made the promise in 2015, no, I'm five saying, years I'm, earlier. No, look, I'm talking of today. The, today, it's a very tightrope walk for him and I think he's doing it very well because if he can actually generate demand, which I think by pumping in money 6 lakh crores into the infrastructure, by two or three vital things he has done. But, but what about my point? We're talking not about pumping money into infrastructure, we're talking about failure to live up to his own promise made five years ago to reduce corporate tax for everyone I'll, I'll to 25%. So he hasn't done it. Uh, In value terms, 99% of companies are excluded. They, how could you do that if on the one hand, you have to take care of the poorest people today. You have a, a huge agrarian so crisis in your hand. So did he make a mistake making so, the promise? No, he had made a, pr a pr promise that gradually they will do it. He didn't say we will do it overnight. And he's doing it gradually, up to 250 well, the crores. The assumption was that he would do it within the first term of office of the Modi government. That has failed. I think he had every intention of doing it. But then this agrarian crisis, which has suddenly become so huge, I think has made them shift uh, priorities and rightly so. That may be a possible explanation, although the finance minister hasn't given it, you've given it on his behalf. But a moment ago, you also compared him enticingly to Mr. Reagan. 
Now, Mr. Reagan's successor at the moment is Donald Trump, and he slashed American corporate taxes to 21% at one go. At the same time, the average corporate tax in Europe is 20%. If in comparison, India's big companies are paying corporate tax at 30%, the finance ministers ensured that they will remain uncompetitive. Once you bring your economy on rail, don't forget there was a twin shock this year of both the demonetization and GST. As the economy revs up, and I think these measures will give it a kickstart, as, as soon as the economy moves, next year they will have the cushion of uh, giving some relief Assuming to the corporate sector. Assuming they are sector. still in power after May next year, that assumption is easy for you to make as an ally. Many others won't make it. But let me come to a second promise that the finances ministers made, not just in this budget, but repeatedly in earlier budgets, which this time, as an MP from a farming state, I put it to you, was one he should never have made because it's impossible to fulfill. It's the promise to double farmers' incomes in five years. That requires growth of 12.5% per year for five years consecutively. And you know that agricultural growth, according to the CSO, is languishing at 2.1%. So I put it to you, this is an impossible promise to fulfill. Was Mr. Jaitley wrong to have made it? And he made it first in 2016. Uh, look, Karan, you make a target. That was a target that he would try to double it. But it's an impossible one target. Second, one second. And if you achieve even 80% or 90% or 70%, if you don't even have a lofty target, you wouldn't get anywhere. Having said that, this so is this is truly a jumla. Then is no, it? No, it's this a, is not a target jumla. and an no, no, aspiration. No, That's no, all. It's a, well, it's uh, aspiring towards that. But the fact that this year, at least a huge beginning has been made by saying we will give 150 percent of cost as the MSP. Production may not have gone up, but then if a farmer's income is going up, that is what he has promised. So you really do believe it's sufficient to explain away an impossible promise made, which everyone knows he could never have fulfilled, as a sort of aspiration. In those terms, you're making it seem acceptable. But you think that is precisely how budget should be drawn up? That you deliver something as a promise, you repeat it, three budgets running, and then you turn around and say when you can't fulfill it, it was only an aspiration, it wasn't much more. Can I say just one thing? I think for the first time since independence, the Prime Minister and the Finance Minister, they are redefining the MSP. Because till now, every government was scared to raise the MSP because they said this would create inflation. This government actually kept the MSP deliberately and consciously low because it wanted to reduce inflation for urban voters. You've penalized the farmer. Now when you're offering to raise the MSP, you're simply undoing the damage you yourself did. Well, to start with, they had no choice. You remember what they inherited? Inflation was totally out of control. The rupee was going haywire. Kind of you the to say that the people who suffered most are your constituents in Punjab. They are the farmers who suffered I, at the cost. I, that is why from day one, my party kept push, putting pressure that please implement the Swaminathan formula. And today, and time and again, we went public on that. And today you're happy because at least you've got something. You may because not have got everything, but you've got something. Because I see them walking in the right direction. Let me bring up another aspect of the budget. And this time I put it to someone who I know is deeply interested in defense matters. I'm talking specifically about the very marginal increase in the defense budget for capital expenditure. It's an increase of just 5.91%. In fact, the business standard points out that if you remove pensions and look at the defense expenditure as a proportion or percentage of GDP, it's actually as low as 1.58%, way below the norm of 3% that most people think is okay. Now, as an MP who follows this closely, you know India has a very troubled relationship at the moment with Pakistan and China. Our defense services need fighter planes, they need submarines, we need tanks, we need missiles, we need howitzers, we need guns and rifles. With this sort of miserable funding, aren't we simply adding to their problems? Karan, you and I both read some economics in college. It comes down to guns versus butter. Governments have to balance these things. After all, if your own people, 65% of the population lives on farms, if you have this kind of a crisis there, you have to then, as I said, it's a tightrope walk, then obviously you can't give too much Can for defense. Can I interrupt there? I would accept it comes down to guns versus butter if butter was winning at the cost of guns, but until the MSP went up this year, 
and that still has to be implemented by the way even butter was losing farmers were losing the only people who were gaining were urban voters of the bjp because in their interest food prices had been kept low so this guns versus butter argument doesn't work because it's not an explanation urban prices were kept low not just by this government traditionally this was the way it was done this this has happened from nehru's time so don't blame them for that this is some the in UPA fact they are making the upa government upa one took the risk of a 70000 crore farm loan waiver nationwide it might have been economically imprudent it certainly addressed a very substantial measure of farmer distress nothing similar has happened this time around the states may have done it individually the bjp government the centers refused to do it so again guns versus butter doesn't work karan i have said repeatedly that it's a very strange thing we first do not give the farmer the right price for his produce then he is desperate he starts committing suicide and then we say okay now we will write off your loans that's not the way it even violates uh, banking discipline the and you think the msp increase this time round is the first sensible step towards correcting absolutely a very distressing situation after a very long time and i welcome it and i am certain that this is going to create the kind of demand that you and i can't even imagine today Since we're talking about the budget I want to raise with you Mr Gujral two aspects of the budget that I believe haven't got the attention they deserve the first is what the government calls the fixed term employment scheme it's now been extended to all sectors of the economy previously it was limited to leather apparel and textiles and my question is a simple one is this a clever way of permitting perhaps by the back door some form of labor flexibility perhaps something that amounts in effect to hire and fire you just said earlier that the productivity is very low why is the productivity in india very low precisely because no government had the courage to bring in labor reform and this the problem here is every prime minister recognizes one thing that the moment you try to formalize it all the unions would be on strike whether it's your airlines whether it's your postals whether it's your nationalized banks they would railways everybody would go on strike so we do it by the back door very clever way and but, a very welcome are, but, way but you are confirming to me as an ally of the government that this is precisely what's being done through the back door labor flexibility is being brought in in a clever way as you put it so that the trade unions don't actually revolt against it i think it is very important if we, if the nation needs to modernize if we need to raise our productivity if we need to get an fdi nothing wrong with that in which case are you surprised or are you relieved that this particular measure hasn't got the attention it deserves from the media after the budget was delivered it's been virtually ignored and forgotten by everyone well i think the trade unions are looking at it they are concerned but the papers and the television channels haven't even noted it because even the pink papers haven't noted it because most papers and the, the whether it's the correspondents or the owners or the editors they know that this is a necessary reform so why create trouble by pointing it out Absolutely. in other words they're colluding with the government to help the government get away well this is something which is in the national interest that's probably understandable let me then bring a second aspect of the budget that hasn't got as far as i'm concerned the attention it deserves it's the enormous salary increases given to the president the vice president and the governors they've got salary increases of over 300% and remember these are officials who anyway get free accommodation transport water electricity telephone and probably in some instances they also get subsidized food now you know better than me because you're a politician that in a country where 30% live below the poverty line and perhaps another 30% live just about at the poverty line is it justified that these officials should get salary increases of over 300% or is there a moral hazard here Karan I don't know how it was calculated quite frankly and even I was surprised that the president would be getting 5 lakhs uh, a month uh, in addition to the perks that you just mentioned uh, but don't forget when the highest bureaucrat in this country is earning 2 lakhs and 50000 rupees the president's getting double that no no once so the governor has to have more than that if his chief secretary is getting 2 lakh 50000 then obviously a governor must get a little more than that which is now 3 lakhs or 3 lakhs 50 uh, somewhere near that but yes i was a little surprised by the president and the vice president salary would you have been happier if their salary increases had been lower you know th- this is really not going to m- m- matter to the economy in a big way but yes you're right 
doesn't send a correct message. It doesn't send a correct message. And in a country where 30% live below the poverty line, it's a morally disturbing way of prioritizing people. Perhaps you're right. Finally, on the budget, Mr. Jaitley has unfortunately completely missed his fiscal deficit target for this year. And he's actually set a new target for next year, which is substantially higher than the one that everyone thought the government would actually be sticking and adhering to. Now, I want to ask you, this missing of two consecutive fiscal deficit targets, will it not have an adverse impact on ratings? Will it not have an adverse impact by pushing up the interest rate? And if it does the latter, and the interest rate does go up, will that not in turn affect growth? And will it not affect inflation? In other words, could we not have cascading consequences? Under normal circumstances, this would have happened. But the world realizes that there were two abnormal incidents or two abnormal uh, changes that which were made. Demonetization created by this government. Yes. And thereafter, GST. Mishandled but the positive by this side government. of that is that a lot of the unorganized sector is now getting formalized. Eventually, so we eventually the compliance will Ghosh improve. Ghosh. But if you go by others, that's not happening. So that's a no, controversy. Compli compliance has to increase, has already started increasing. If you just go by the number of new SSEs, both in, under GST and in the income tax. Will you be upset if Moody's downgrades India, if Standard & Poor downgrade India, which many think could happen? I don't think they would do that because they are, very, they are also uh, heartened by the fact that this was not a populist budget. There, there is a difference between a popular budget and a populist budget. There were no freebies like that. So I think they are heartened by that and the very fact, two things. They will be there two, for no, understanding of the fiscal did. slippage. Exactly. Government had a target of 80,000 crores or 72,000 crores uh, initially for disinvestment. They, in the revised estimates, they took it up to 80,000, but they are achieving 100,000. And next year again, right now they're saying 80,000, but this could go up All to 100,000. All of this you're saying will cheer Moody's, it will cheer absolutely, Standard & Poor's. Absolutely. And you're therefore banking on them being understanding. Yes. The problem is, Moody's and Standard & Poor's may well be reflective of your thinking. Your own allies, the TDP and the Shiv Sena, are not. Both of them have come out with strong criticism. The TDP has gone beyond criticism. They're disenchanted. They're disillusioned. What is the official position of your party, the Akali Dal, on the budget as a whole? As I said, we are delighted because we are a farmer's party. So we feel that finally the farmer has got a good deal and we support this budget. Yes, we also realize perhaps a little more could have been done for the middle class, but given the constraints, the government's hands were tied and I personally feel it is good to show some fiscal discipline which the finance minister has certainly done. Some being the only operative word, he hasn't shown very much, only some. I think his hands were tied. As I said, don't forget, again and again I keep repeating the two major changes that took place, demonetization and GST. Both of which the government is responsible but for. Which are transformative. Let's Long term, this will affect the economy very positively. Let's not get deflected into a debate about GST and demonetization. Let's come back to the TDP and the Shiv Sena. Both of those have actually expressed not just disappointment, they both brought up the possibility of breaking with the NDA. And let's be honest, disenchantment with the NDA is not limited to Andhra or to Maharashtra. It's broken out in UP, it's broken out with your allies in Bihar. Is there a danger that the NDA is crumbling? Let's talk of TDP and Shiv Sena first. TDP's complaints are to an extent genuine. Andhra Pradesh was promised a package on the floor of the house. They, they were promised that they would get a special status, which now they've been denied. Of course, the government now says that under GST it is not possible. But the substantial amount of money that was promised by Dr. Manmohan Singh's government has not been honored by the successive government. So TDP is genuine in feeding let down. That's so just they feel feeding let, let, down. let down. They feel let down. People of Andhra Pradesh feel let down. And I think personally also something much, much more should be done for that state because it's a new state. It had a deficit. It inherited a deficit. It was born with a deficit budget. So whereas Telangana, they created the entire infrastructure in Telangana. 
Telangana had a huge surplus budget. So the Akali Dal sympathizes with the TDP. We sympathize with them. You think that the concerns Chandra Babu is raising are genuine? Genuine. And he has good grounds to feel let down? He has not been given what governments had promised. Well, even if they could not give him 100% of what was promised, they should have walked more than halfway. Who do you blame for that? Central government. Why is the central government let down a critical ally? It's their only ally in the south of any concern and sub substance. I personally don't understand it because I also know that time and again promises have been made to them. Yet nothing has been delivered. And here you're not saying that the finance minister's hands were tied. That excuse you haven't used here. In other words, he's deliberately and consciously chosen not to fulfill promises he made and to let down allies. I don't think these decisions are taken at the finance minister's level. It's higher up. Absolutely. In other words, the blame or the responsibility for letting down an ally rise with the prime minister. It always does. It's normal. So you blame the prime minister for mishandling a critical alliance? I think they need to make amends. How? By giving some money. They have to create some money for Andhra Pradesh. But that would be almost like apologizing or at least accepting they made a mistake. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong with that. In politics one, and in life, one makes mis mistakes and then you try to rectify those mistakes. But the BJP has never actually accepted it's made a mistake, leave aside rectified mistakes in public. It may go against the perceived manner in which they behave or what people sometimes call their arrogance. Current coalition politics doesn't work like that. You cannot run coalitions with arrogance. Coalitions are, have to be run the way Mr. Vajpayee ran a coalition what we used to call the rainbow co coalition. You suspect that there's a certain arrogance or akkar, if I can use a Punjabi word, on the part of the BJP when it comes to handling their allies. You are saying that, not me. But you're not disagreeing. That's the important part. Well, as I said, they need to be a little more diplomatic in the handling of the Is allies. Is there a danger that TDP MPs may resign as one or two have threatened they might? Is there a danger that TDP could be pushed so far to the wall they may walk out of the NDA altogether? I hope that does not happen. It would neither be in the interest of the country, the NDA or the TDP for that matter. But as I said, it's not just the TDP that is unhappy. The TDP is particularly unhappy, but the Shiv Sena is unhappy. The Shiv Sena has even announced they won't be fighting the Lok Sabha elections and presumably the Maharashtra elections in alliance with the BJP. And as I said, allies of yours in Bihar and UP are now disenchanted. What is going wrong in the handling of this alliance? You see, what is happening is that the local units of the BJP there are trying to, in a way, get into the turf of the allied parties. And that is normal for an allied party to uh, then react. They want more seats for Lok Sabha. Do you blame the BJP for this? I, I, for that, I certainly do. Because this is not the coalition dharma. So is the PM encouraging them? to step and trespass on the toes of their allies? And has he failed to restrain them? I won't blame only the PM. I would blame the BJP as a whole. Collectively, they have to rethink that if they want a coalition in the future, then they can't ride roughshod over the interests of the allies. The BJP is mishandling the NDA. The BJP is not dealing with the allies with the finesse or the d diplomacy that is required. They're not even being fair to the allies. I can say that too. They're taking their allies for granted. You could say that. In fact, not just for granted, they're breaking promises they've made in the case of the TDP. They're letting them down. That's what I said. Amends are very important. Otherwise, this will have disastrous consequences. Let's come to a couple of other subjects before we end this interview. I want to talk to you about the judicial crisis that looms over the country. Important opposition parties like Congress and the TMC have demanded a discussion in Parliament. The BJP has made it clear it's against it. Where does your party, the Akali Dal, stand on this issue? Should it be discussed in Parliament or not? I think there is no harm in discussing it in Parliament. And what are we saying? All we are saying is that if the four topmost judges cannot sit together, then what happens to the collegium system? What happens to the new appointments? As it is, there are millions of cases hanging fire. People are waiting for more than 20 years. And now, if the whole process of judicial appointments come to a standstill, what will happen? We are only creating anarchy. Are you putting pressure as an ally on the BJP to agree to a discussion in Parliament? I said that in the all-party meeting, that we should discuss it. There's nothing wrong with that. Is the BJP willing to listen to you? We will see in the, this week. 
because now many more parties have raised this issue. But uh, look, it has nothing to do with BJP. This has to do with the justice system of this country. And the one reason why increasingly you see so much lawlessness in this country is because there is no justice given on time. How do you, as an Akali Dal MP, how do you as Naresh Gujral respond to the fact that the four most senior judges of the Supreme Court have raised deeply distressing doubts and I won't go so far as to say allegations, but deeply distressing doubts about the integrity of the Chief Justice on the one hand, as well as about the integrity of their junior brother judges on the other hand. In both instances, they've questioned the integrity of the people concerned. It's very unfortunate and I wish this kind of dirty linen had not been washed in public. But it has they been. They should have s sorted this out within the system. But now that it's been washed in public, Sita Ram Yajuri says, you don't just need to discuss it, you need to investigate it to find out if there is basis to these allegations. And he's therefore suggested that one way Parliament can do this is to move an impeachment motion. Would you be in favour of going to that extent? I think, I think that is too radical. First, Parliament needs to debate it. And let's see what kind of uh, consensus emerges from that. But could a debate possibly lead to some sort of impeachment motion? I doubt it. You and doubt I, it. it shouldn't happen. In a recent press conference, Kapil Sibyl, supported by Salman Khurshid, have raised worrying questions about the Justice Lawyer case, which, as you know, is one of the issues that's disturbed the four judges of the Supreme Court. Kapil has made it clear at his press conference that two other people known to Justice Lawyer died in very mysterious circumstances shortly after his own death, and a third just about survived and could have died had he been in the wrong place at the wrong time. And Kapil Sibyl is demanding an SIT, a special investigation team, without any members of the NIA or the CBI. Do you believe this case warrants this sort of independent investigation? You know, Karan, this kind of allegation has only been made by the Congress. Even the media has not raised these issues. Well, the elements of the media like Caravan have. Now the National Herald has taken it up in the last 24 hours. <laughs> Look, Caravan and National Herald, you do, let's not joke. The, the mainstream media has not really but raised they, it. But the matter is officially in front of the Supreme Court by way of a PIL. The Chief Justice's own bench is handling it. So if these facts that have been made public by Kapil Sibyl are correct, that it wasn't just Justice Lawyer who died in mysterious circumstances, two other people that he had reached out to also died mysteriously and a third just avoided being killed. Does that not warrant an independent investigation? If some more credible evidence comes out, it certainly requires... You don't think what Kapil has revealed is Just credible? going by what Kapil says is not credible evidence. I because mean, you think he's party-free? You has think he has an axe he to, has to he, he, Of course he has. He, he bats for the Congress party. He's a Congress member of Parliament. And you're also saying, presumably, that at this moment of time, he hasn't brought out enough evidence to justify a special investigation. But all of this can be discussed if the matter is discussed in Parliament. That discussion, perhaps, is now even more necessary. That's why I said we support that discussion. And then we will see what evolves from there. Let's move on to another subject of importance, the Padmavati controversy. How do you view the original stand taken by BJP governments in Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, Gujarat, who, until the Supreme Court overruled them, had decided that their states would not screen Padmavati, despite the fact the film had got CBFC clearance. Do you believe, given the potential law and order threat that they thought existed, they were justified? Or do you think they were in breach of their constitutional duty to uphold free speech? Which of the two? Look, as far as the state of Rajasthan is concerned, I do feel that this would have created a huge law and order situation. Uh, I am not justifying why this would have created a law and order situation, but there the emotions were running, running very high. So Rajasthan's government saying they won't allow it to be screened, even though it has clearance, could have been justified because of special circumstances. Exactly. What about Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat? I think there it, the chief ministers could have handled the law and order situation very effectively by themselves. There was no need to ban it there. And uh, I am not personally in favor of any bans once the so you, you get a certificate from the censors. So I think unless it is you are certain that this will create a huge law and order situation in a state, as, as, as I feel would have happened in Rajasthan, I feel otherwise we should not indulge in such uh, gimmicks. The interesting thing is yesterday, Friday, the Karni Sena has officially withdrawn their protest against the film Padmavati. They've now officially declared in a statement that they believe the film actually is a 
paean of praise and it valorizes Rajput glory and Rajput reputation. Given that now the Karni Sena itself has changed their position and their original protests were being done on the basis of not even seeing the film, do you think BJP governments were just pusillanimous in trying to ban the film without seeing it themselves either? Karan, I would look at it in a larger perspective that this kind of activity, an activity which is carried out by goons, has to be dealt with very firmly. And governments have to do that and dealing. Every single government, whether it's a BJP government or non-BJP government, if they don't deal with it effectively, they let down the people and the country. And when BJP governments fail to tackle the goons and end up buckling under pressure to ban films, then they're letting down their constitutional responsibility. Absolutely. So Gujarat and Madhya Pradesh at least let down their constitutional responsibility. What Vajpayee ji once said, Raj Dharma. They let it down. Exactly. And it shouldn't happen because if you allow goons to get away with it, then we are taking the country back to Bihar days of the 60s and 70s when private armies were ruling the roost. So Mr. Vajpayee would be embarrassed by what BJP governments in Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat have done. I he think would not so. approve. I, I certainly think so. Are you concerned about the way Muslims are being taunted and targeted by people and elements who are close either to the RSS or the government? I'm talking specifically about the VHP, the ABVP and assorted Gaurakshaks. And I have in mind not just what's been happening in Kasganj in UP at the moment, but what's happened repeatedly in Alward, what even happened on a suburban train between Delhi and Faridabad not so long ago. Does that taunting, that targeting of Muslims worry you? A lot. And what really worries me is that a vast, 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 I would say overwhelming majority of Indians, be it Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, Christians, we are all secular. We have been, we were, we were born and trained and educated to live with tolerance, with, with uh, accommodation, respect of each other's religions and compassion, today that is missing. Why is it missing? Because a very tiny minority is hijacking this Indian ethos. And that is where I think the state must come down very heavily. And I am very, very upset and surprised why the state does not act, act against these goons. But the state in each of these instances was BJP governments at the state level and they, the ones who didn't come down. Irrespective of who rules, I think they let the country down when they don't act. And if you do not act now, a stage will come when these goons will get totally out of hand. So BJP and I have personally repeated it, repeatedly said this, both publicly and in an all-party meeting to the Prime Minister's face. What that for God's sake, take action. When you repeatedly said this to the Prime Minister, what did he say? Because he's noted for his silence on these issues. Rarely does he speak out. If he does admonish his party, we don't find out about it. All we know is that his silence suggests not complicity, but acquiescence, as if it's approval. I don't think it is approval, but I must admit that here I'm disappointed and I do feel that the state must act firmly. You're disappointed in the Prime Minister? I am disappointed in the government for not acting more firmly because if events like that get out of hand, this country will not be governable anymore. And if that happens, you would blame the government? Obviously, you have to blame the government. I can't blame you for that. And that's a government you're an ally of? That's why I said. I'm saying it openly that they must act. So you are really deeply worried about this? I'm extremely worried about it and so is my party because we represent a minority uh, of this country. And I've said this before also that minorities must feel safe and secure in this country. And at the moment they don't? Unfortunately, you're right. At the moment the Muslims feel threatened, they feel unwanted, they feel they are being targeted. Why this is happening? Because a very, very minuscule minority is not being punished. But you know, you keep saying it's happening at the hands of a minority. The truth is, and I'm going to put this to you, just look for a moment what BJP leaders say about Muslims. I'm only going to take examples from the month of January. I deliberately won't go further back in time. But in January, that's last month, a BJP MLA in Rajasthan said, the way Muslim population is increasing, the existence of Hindus is in danger. Again, in January last month, 
a BJP MLC in Karnataka said Muslims associated with Congress are killers. Again, last month, a BJP MLA in Rajasthan said that it was a mistake to let Muslims stay in India after partition. He said Hindus were denied crores worth of property. And I've deliberately only taken examples from January. But you know, Naresh Gujarat, almost in every single month since 2014, there are multiple examples every month of BJP leaders making such rancid, rabid comments about Muslims. How do you, how does your party respond to this? Because this keeps happening. My party strongly condemns all these statements. These are irresponsible statements. And I repeat, action should be taken by the BJP against such leaders. If they don't, we threaten our national security. And the BJP is supposed to be devoted to national security above anything else. So when you raise this at meetings with the government, at your private meetings with the prime minister, what answer do you get? So I have not had a private meeting with the Prime Minister to raise this issue. I raised it in an all-party meeting. And I was promised that action would be taken. By the PM? Well, by, by the various ministers. But the, what is really happening is they warn these leaders, but they are not taking action. And I think now time has come. But you know, we have a very strong Prime Minister who, when he asserts his will, gets his way. Is it that he's deliberately weakly responding because I can't believe he wants to change things and is unable to do so. Karan, I don't know how, what are the inner dimensions of their setup. But as I said, as an ally and as a party which represents a minority, we strongly condemn this. One last question on this. Many people fear that if the economy doesn't pick up and with every passing day as the promises Mr. Modi made during his election campaign seem not to be fulfilled, the BJP will increasingly resort to polarizing between Hindus and Muslims as a way of winning the next election. Does that worry you? First of all, I'm an optimist and I'm convinced that this budget will make sure that the economy will flourish. So I'm not uh, for a minute with you on this page that economy will not flourish or that they will not but have are enough. Are you worried about the fear that the country, the population may be polarized, Hindu versus Muslim? I feel that it is better to lose an election than to polarize people and create divisions because the kind of damage that it does to society and to the country uh, is long term. And you're prepared to say that to the BJP itself? I'm saying it on camera to you. Whether they hear it or not is their problem. But I'm repeating it. It's better to lose an election than polarize the country to win it. Exactly. In other words, if it comes to that, you're saying to the BJP, lose the election in the interest of the country don't polarize in your own interest. All I'm saying is don't allow a minority of your leadership to polarize the politics of this country. In the light of what we're discussing, how do you respond to the by-election results from Rajasthan? I'm not just talking about the fact that Congress won all three seats. I'm talking about the huge swings in their favor, 25% in Alwar, a switch of some 250,000 votes in Ajmer, and the fact that after 17 assembly seats altogether in contention, the BJP had 15, Congress has now got all 17. So it's a huge sweep in Congress's favor when usually, by the way, bipoles go in the ruling party's interest, not in the opposition's. How do you respond to that? Karan, I think pe poor people of this country are now getting restless, impatient. We made commitments to them. We said we will create jobs. We said we will ensure that economies will, will bounce back. Unfortunately, the last few years, we have had a huge agrarian crisis, which is also reflective of what happened in Gujarat, uh, in Saurashtra region, and now in uh, Rajasthan. People are impatient. They want change. And also, public memories are short. After four years, they've forgotten the kind of corruption that the Congress government's indulged in. They've forgotten the, the way UPA had, was, was squandering away the, the national resources. They've forgotten how their ministers were only gallivanting around the world and not working. Whereas, I must admit, say one thing, that this government takes governance very seriously. And they have brought in <coughs> transformative changes. Can but I, the results take time and people I, are impatient. Can I interrupt? Listening to what you said, 
When you look at the Rajasthan by-election results, and then you remember before that what happened in Gujarat, where the BJP just managed a majority, coming down, by the way, to sing double figures. Do you sense that the political mood in the country is changing, particularly in northern India? Well, I have said earlier also that the days of single-party dominance are over. BJP on its own will not get a majority in 2019. You're saying that? I'm saying it repeatedly because that is the reality. You can see it. There will be a coalition, but I'm convinced that it will be an NDA coalition because... But you're also convinced that BJP will not get that magical 272. Absolutely. Which means that Mr. Modi won't be as powerful a prime minister. He won't have the numbers in his own party to back him. He'll need allies. He'll be dependent on them in a way he's not today. Mr. Vajpayee governed very effectively with so many allies. But he was a different man, a different personality. Well, I'm s sure Mr. Modi has the capacity to change. Can he adjust to that situation? I'm sure he will. And I think he's, a, he's the kind of leader that the country needs today. He is a strong leader. He, he means well. He's an honest leader. He's ensured that there is no corruption in his cabinet. He's ensured that bureaucrats come to work at least on time. There is delivery happening. But it's, as I said, it's a, such a huge system. Now he has to ensure that he can be dependent upon allies, that he can no longer stand up to a TDP and ignore the promises he's made, that he can no longer afford to offend the Shiv Sena, that he has to now keep them on side in a way in which the emollient, affable personality of Mr. Vajpayee was able to do. Mr. Modi tends to be arrogant and abrasive. He has to change all of that. Look, in life, we all evolve. And we all adjust to changing situations. The reality is the numbers. In other words, Mr. Modi has no choice but to evolve and change. Exactly. In these circumstances, would the Akali Dal favor early national elections to coincide with the state elections due in Madhya Pradesh and Rajasthan this December? You know, it's a matter of just a th three or four months. And I personally feel that it's a waste of money. And also, governance comes to a standstill during election times. So if these states are going to polls in let's say November, December, and then we have elections in April, May, there will be effectively no governance. So what you're saying is bring the national elections forward to December? Or postpone these elections by a month, which I think is also constitutionally possible. Election Commission, I think, has the right, uh, but I'm not sure on that. Uh, but even if national elections were to be pre-pawned three months or four months, Heavens will not fall. Is there not a danger after the Rajasthan by-election defeat that the BJP has suffered, and it's pretty sweeping, that if you pre pone the national elections to coincide with the Rajasthan election and the Madhya Pradesh election, then the disaffection at state level could affect the national election as well, and the BJP may do much worse. Can I ask you a question? Do you think if Mr. Vajpayee had not pre pawned the election and held those elections four months later, you think he would have come back to power? These things don't matter. If you're losing, you're going to lose. Exactly. Whether it's three months there or three months here, doesn't Absolutely. matter. Absolutely. And if we can save money, and if we can ensure that governance doesn't come to a standstill, and it's, that's in the national interest, so I think we should do so. So to sum your position up, you're in favor of bringing the national elections forward, in a sense coinciding them with Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh. Not just, you could do nine states. There is, there, there is Rajasthan, M M Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, even Odisha, if I'm sure uh, Mr. Patnaik would not mind. Tamil Nadu is... is in uh, which case, there are 19 states where the BJP, either on its own or with allies, are in power. You're saying all of no, those could bring All forward. is not possible. But I, I ask that only for one reason, because something else the BJP is strongly in favor of, the Prime Minister in particular, is combining national and state elections. Now, I was going to ask you, A, do you support that idea? I assume from your answer you do because you're saying the more you have together, the better because you have better governance. And if you do support the idea, then why shouldn't the Prime Minister put his money where his talk is and bring those 19 states forward and give the country one big grand election? Because if he does, holdouts like Mr. Naveen Patnaik would find it very difficult to resist and even the Congress would find it difficult to resist. This would be one way of securing combined elections by simply showing you've got the courage to do it yourself with your own states? I don't think, Karan, that's going to happen. Do you think Yogi Adityanath, who's just come to power a year ago, would agree to have elections uh, again now? Or do you think states like Punjab, 
where Congress came to power last year would want to go to elections. That is not that is a pipe dream that cannot happen. So but yes, eight, nine states, it, it is possible. And if eight or nine states go to polls simultaneously with the center, there is, I would welcome that. So then where do you stand on the concept of combining national and state elections? Do you think it's a pipe dream that it's not going to be possible I, because I, people I have different horizons and different agendas? You have to take all the states along. We are a federal state. It can't be that uh, unilaterally the central government decides. So this How will you even bring in the constitutional changes? So this is one concept of Mr. Modi's that your party doesn't fully support or support no, no, at we all. Support. What he, I think what he's trying to say is that if eight, nine states to start with can go to polls with the center, let's start the experiment you at least. You support it in a diluted experimental form, not in the grand actual holding of all elections together. Because that is more pragmatic. All right, let's leave it there. Naresh Gujarat, you've been extremely outspoken. You've said some things that I hope the country listens to very carefully. More importantly, you've said things that I hope the BJP and the Prime Minister in particular listen to very, very closely. For being so open and so frank, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Karan. It's always a pleasure.